Hello, Board Game Crusaders. Welcome to the second edition. Today, we will be going over Sedition Wars. First, I do want to thank everybody that has shared, liked, subscribed, or whatever to my YouTube video. It is very exciting to see those numbers increase. I appreciate that very much. I know I'm just in the hundreds, but it's still exciting for me. And thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, today, I'm doing Sedition Wars, as I said. The reason I've decided to go with Sedition Wars this time around is because a lot of people are questioning whether it's a fun game. Because there was a little bit of mass confusion with the first edition. The first edition had some rules that were not the clearest, and some quality control issues on the tiles. They warp a little bit, and they're maybe not the clearest to read when it comes to um, covering terrain and so forth. Not only that, but they've already revised the character cards, so they have different rules than they were initially created with. Uh, all that within a first brief year of this game being around, so that's caused a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths. But good news is, if you email the person in the link below, you will be able to get the updated character sheets, and, or character cards, I should say, the map tiles and the rules for a measly $3. Very worth the cost, I think. So... Um, with that said, there's a couple things that are a necessity for this game. Even with my awesome tutorial, you're going to want to go get the Esoteric Order of Gamers um, Game Aid, which gives you a quick reference, because even on the second edition rolls, the quick reference is non-existent. You're going to want one of those. And this is the best one that I've found, so I'll include that link below as well. How do you know which version you're dealing with? is quite simple. You open up your rule book, page one, right around this section. It's going to see 2012 or 2013. And of course, your map tiles are probably going to be worked up a little bit if it's a first edition. But that rule check is the best way to know right out of the gate which version you're dealing with. The very next thing that I recommend taking care of is painting your minis. Now, if you're going to go out and professionally paint these, more power to you. That's going to take a lot of time. There's a lot of minis in this. I enjoy painting, just not on this scale. I'd rather get down to the game and play it. So what I've done is I've painted everybody a different color. I've taken one of each character and left it gray, one of each remaining character and colored it, and so on and so on and so on. The reason I've done this is because, as you can see, there are five of this model. And if they're all gray, one of them takes damage, you also have five identical cards, and you don't know which guy you're going to mark the damage on. So what I find to work is I've colored them colors that I have little glass markers for. So for the red guy, I either put this on the corner, or actually what I really do is I, I use it to indicate the health. And then I just mark down the health with the dice, or the, the glass. Um, other things that I've seen people do is put these in sleeves and use a dry erase marker and just check them down. Some of the characters have a lot more health, and this glass bead is a little bit too large to mark that, I find. So what I do is I just take one of the regular tokens, flip it upside down, and I just mark it like this, and I just go down as needed. Um, the rules recommend getting a paper clip and clipping it on. I think that's a little tacky myself, so this is what I would recommend doing. If you've got a better idea, I'd love to see it in the comments. Um, Hopefully I don't feel like a fool for painting all mine colors like this after seeing your genius ideas, but that's what I'd do, and that's what I've done, so take it for what it's worth. Here's what the card looks like. Um, the top portion is just kind of referencing what kind of a character you're dealing with, so when you're looking to build an army, it'll tell you sometimes in the objectives what kind of troops you can use. You're going to want to look at this to see that. Um, the cost is also when you're building an army, so you get to build 50 points. This tells you how many points this unit costs towards your, your build. Tactics is how many tactics counters this unit can hold at any given time. Also, if it's your highest ranking unit, meaning it's got the highest tactics number of all of your active units, that's how many tactics you can replenish your pool with. Cover that in a second though. Size is really irrelevant, I think. I don't know why they included it. N is normal, which means it's a one square base. Um, L is the other option, which is large. You can clearly see the difference the bases look quite larger. So they could have left that off for all intents and purposes. Um, this kind of outlines what attacks are available to utilize. And over here we have 
how far they can move, what their defense rating is, and what their health rating is. Their health rating is tracked on this little track here, so you can just kind of keep track with some sort of counter. Um, right here is the modifier that the attack does. So when you're making an attack, you roll three dice, you add the results of the three dice to the modifier, and if the result equals or is greater than the shield value of the unit that you're attacking, your attack was successful, and you deal damage based on the little first number in the D slash S section. Um, so you deal five damage to that unit. Now the little S represents any sixes you may have rolled. For every single six you roll, you get to add that as well. So say I rolled three dice, one of them was a six. Um, I would do seven damage. If I rolled two sixes, I do nine damage with that equation. And each attack has different abilities and different effects that may come into play. Uh, for example, if you use this um, saber, what is that, the saber overload, it does a lot of damage, but it also means that you can't uh, make a saber attack until your next activation, which you know, might sound stupid. Well, my next activation, I can attack with it. What's the big deal? The big deal is there are reflex abilities that some units have. This one, for example, if something moves in its line of sight, it can make a free pot shot at it, and as long as it's a ranged attack. And if you look, all of the ranged attacks are saber attacks. So if you do that, you would not be able to utilize that very amazing reflex trigger. Um, which brings me to the back of the card. On the back of the card there are traits and abilities. Traits are things that are inherent in the unit. They can just utilize those and, and do them at their will. Sorry about the focus issue. Uh, hopefully we can resolve that here soon. But uh, then there's effects. Effects usually cost something. Um, in the case of the Vanguard, it costs tactics, usually. In the case of the Strain, it costs nano counters. Um, the Strain units look slightly different. There's only one piece of information that's new on this, and that's the evolution right here. And that just says that if you have six nano counters next to this beast's figure, then this beast can become the Brimstone. And if that does end up happening, then you simply replace the card with the brimstone card and replace the figure with the brimstone figure. Any health that was lost on the previous model before the uh, evolution is regained, but any effects like bleeding, corrosion, or any of that other stuff you're going to want to look at that quick sheet for, um, those are still in effect until they are resolved by removing them with the die roll. The last thing you want to know on the card is the range which is this little section right here. Uh, range, the C means close, which means you're base to base contact. S is short range, which is four tiles out or within. M is medium, which is eight tiles out or within. And then L would be long, this figure doesn't have it, but L is long, which is 12 tiles out or closer. The game has a lot of tokens and for this portion, there's a lot to go over. You're going to want to reference it over and over again throughout the gameplay anyway. So again, check the link on the bottom. Get that quick uh, reference guide. The only things that I'm going to cover here briefly, because some of them they won't even mention very clearly in the rules. This one, for example, is never mentioned at all. It is uh, the area effect. So some, like uh, this token, has an area of effect that stays on the board for a certain amount of time. You place that there, that indicates that is causing an area of effect that large. So that's where that bad boy comes into play. This is a corpse counter. Anytime that anything dies, unless it's corroded, um, which again, get that quick reference sheet, you're going to want it, um, leaves a corpse, which then the strain units, the strain can turn into a, a cheaper strain unit. Uh, this. Uh, again, there's really no reference of this in the rules, so you don't know what it is, but I, I believe this is the override token. So if a unit is being, or has the override um, on it from one of the strain abilities, put this on that card. This is a civilian, this is a target marker, and this is one of those infamous tactics points that the Vanguard have. 
I'll go over these at a later time. These are all pretty self-explanatory. This is a shield which some of the stronger Vanguard units can utilize as a trait. This indicates that a unit is infected. These snap onto the bottom of the unit. This one can be stackable. In fact, you can infect something up to four times, so you can stack up to four of those on a unit. This is a nano counter, which basically represents airborne toxins or a virus, I guess, that the strain uses to spread, evolve itself. They use those like tactics points and also to reanimate the corpses. A little more detail on this because I realize it's not going to be very clear if I don't specify now. This is a shield that certain units get to start the game with. Uh, it'll say on the back of the card on the traits, uh, displacement field if they get this. You clip it on the bottom of the guy. This allows the guy to avoid one damage every turn or every attack that you'd like. Or you can deplete it and remove it completely so you don't get to use it any further but it'll avoid an entire attack. Now you need to decide how you want to play. There's a couple different ways to go about this. There's the campaign and strategic setup. Um, the campaign goes through kind of a storyline and the setup is quite simple. And it gives you a key to what you're looking at here in the map so you know how to set up. It gives you a little bit of flavor text to let you know the story, what's going on. And then down here, we're looking at specific objectives for the Vanguard and the Strain. Um, a scenario deployment, which basically tells you the rules of how to build your army, uh, how many force points you get, which units you can use, uh, all that good stuff. Um, set up for uh, special objective tokens or, or these bad boys. Uh, and then there's the special conditions, which if there are any changes to the rules from the base game that apply to this mission, those will be there. Campaign setup is found on page 39 in version 1 of the rules or 43 in version 2 of the rules. Strategic is found on page 34 in version 1 or 38 in version 2. Strategic, if you decide to go that way, um, basically you and your opponent can either choose a strategic mission that you like to do, or if you can't decide or you, you're argumentative, just pick up a dice, a roll, and based on the result, a 1 to 2 is a vanguard, a 3 to 4 is a strain, 5 to 6 is a head to head generic. Um, once you roll your dice, depending on what you get, if you get a vanguard, you roll again. There's the result, strain, you roll again. Strategic, you roll again, and get your results. So then the setup for those is vaguely touched upon here. It tells you the setup, the scenario rules, the victory conditions. It's going to tell you if you have any specific maps you have to use, any specific victory conditions, uh, or any of these strategic points that you can use. If it doesn't specify, then you can just choose whatever you'd like. Uh, you want to get to know the maps before you get into the map building. Uh, there's some special rules on page 37 of version 1 or 41 of version 2 that kind of outline some special rules that some of the maps have. I'll let you cover that on your own by looking at the rules, because uh, you're probably going to want to reference them as you're playing anyway. So now you've selected your scenario, you've selected your board tiles, you can select your board tiles however you see fit. Each opponent can choose one at a time until you've got the amount that you want to use. And just place them randomly or systematically as you take turns or whatever you want to do for placing board tiles. Um, every board tile you choose or place in the game gives you 20 points towards your build out of your troops. So if you're playing with four tiles for instance, you get to use 80 points to build your army. Um, that again is referenced right here on the unit card. Um, if you're playing with four tiles and using 80 points, you divide the point total of 80 by 10, in this example, giving you eight. That means you have to have a minimum of eight characters on your team. So you can't just have an 80 point val uh, team and put two big hulking monsters out there you've got to kind of even it out. You have to have at least eight characters in that situation. If you're using two tiles, you get a 40 point army, therefore you have to use at least four tiles, or four units. So, pretty uh, straightforward for building your army and setting things up. And you place your objective markers. Um, 
Again, the campaign outlines that pretty clearly. The strategic rule uh, scenarios will tell you some, some vague basics on how to do that. Um, and when you're placing your objective tokens, again, they can either be, well, I don't know if this is again, this is like my third take, but the, they can either be uh, these um, numbers that you have to hit in a certain sequence, or they can be strategic points that you have to activate. Um, strategic points can only be activated once per activation. So you, if it's a health one, for example, for the Vanguard, you can't put three guys by it and heal them all. You can only use that once per activation. Um, or if it's the, the strain one that allows you to um, mutate troops, uh, you can only do that, again, once per activation. And some of these uh, strategic points have to be stood on. Some of them could be stood, stand, stood by. Uh, it, it'll clarify. Again, you're going to want to get that quick reference sheet. It is crucial for this game. The link's below. Keep an eye on it. Um, let's see. When you're building, when you're placing your strategic points, there are some rules you want to use. Uh, first of which is if a tile, or a room rather, is 8 by 8 or smaller, it can only have one of these. 8 by 8 is easy to count out. This room is 1, 2, 3, 4 by 1, 2, 3. So it can only contain one. Another condition you're going to want to be aware of is you can only have a total of four of these for your faction. So a total of eight will go in the game, four from you, four from your opponent, and you can only have two of any given type, which is okay because they only give you two tokens, so that'll be easy to keep track of. Um, strategic points must be at least three squares away from a section door. These blue ones are the section doors. And they have to be at least six squares apart from one another. So that's uh, pretty straightforward when you're placing these. Again, you can roll a dice, the person who rolls the highest gets to place first, then you alternate placing them until they've all been placed. Only four of them can be on a given tile. Deploying your forces in a strategic mission is also quite simple. Um, in this case, well, in any case, you basically pick an empty side of the board that's not connected to another board and you can build or place your armies within five squares of the entrance. So that's how you're going to deploy your forces and maybe if your friend or your opponent got to place his or her strategic point first, maybe you get to choose where you start first. You can mix that up however you'd like or you can just roll for it again. At the beginning of each turn, depending on who you're playing, whether it be the Vanguard or the Strain, you get Force Management. This is before you activate all of your individual units. Uh, the Vanguard Force Management is pretty straightforward. Sorry again about the focus issues, I don't know what's happening with my camera today. Uh, but essentially, there we go, um, for the Vanguard, you replenish your TACnet pool. What that means is you look at all of the active characters that you have still alive, you look at the highest tactics value, which in this case would be four, and you replenish your pool by giving yourself four of these in a general pool that you can allocate later. Those don't go away unless you use them, so you can hang on to them, or you can spend them freely. Uh, the next thing that you do is you use these by either assigning them to a unit, uh, they can only hold as many as they have on their um, tactics number um, or keeping them in the pool. If you keep them in the pool, you can utilize them to place these target markers on any enemy units that are in line of sight to any of your units. And that basically gives your units a plus three to your dice roll modifiers uh, when you're attacking something with this. And then this goes away from that unit and there are other abilities that some of these units have that can take advantage of these. For example, there's one guy that can shoot people even through hindering terrain and walls if they've got one of these on them. But then you remove that immediately. Um, so that is how they use their tack net. Now these tokens, once they're assigned to the unit, can be used for several things. Sometimes um, these event markers are activated by those. Sometimes, if you look on the back, they've got abilities that are activated by those. Uh, so, those are kind of good to have handy on your guys if you want them to be 
very useful. As far as the strain is concerned, it's a little bit more complex for the strain, but you know, with the complexity comes the awesomeness, I think. Um, first thing, if you're using this guy and it ended up eating somebody on your last turn, the very first thing you do on this turn is decide what he's doing with that. Um, he can choose to A, pretty much just consume whatever was inside of him and replace it with four spore counters, or B, he can immediately evolve whatever's inside of him into a level four infected unit, or the last option is he can spit it out up to two squares away. You wouldn't really want to spit it out, I don't think, unless you've already evolved it. So evolve, even though it's pretty powerful to get that level four right away, it's at least gonna be a two turn process. Um, but once he spits him out, he immediately gets to evolve, which is pretty sweet. And uh, another note on that, since I probably won't come back to it, if he has eaten something and has taken 10 damage or more, or is destroyed, then whatever was inside of him bursts out and gets to be in a square next to him. If he wasn't destroyed or if he was destroyed, it just goes in one of the four squares this massive beast was occupying. That's the first thing the strain character does, if applicable. Next is moving the nano counters. The nano counters get to move six squares. They don't have to pay attention to these little airlock wimpy doors, but, or not the airlock, the little wimpy regular doors, but these airlock doors, they cannot open or go through. So another reason why the strain character wants to leave those open but it just moves one, two, three, four, five, six, and there you go. And these can, it doesn't really matter how many of these are in a square. You can stack these as high as you'd like. They can all be in one square uh, and you're okay with that. They don't have any occupancy rules. In fact, they can even inhabit squares that other things are in. So no worries there. Um, next, if you're the strain and you've moved your nano counters, you mutate infected models. An infected model is a model with one of these red infection tokens clipped to the bottom. They are stackable, as I mentioned earlier. Um, if a human unit has been infected two times or has this wonderful override token on it, it can be treated as an enemy unit by, by its friends just to keep it from spreading because if it does evolve into something nasty then that's worse than if it just died sometimes but the way that the evolve works is um, if he has three or four infections on it, it determines how it can evolve um, if it's a level three infection you get to replace the infected model with a phase one necroform or two nano counters to kind of spread the goodness and then it's removed, it doesn't leave a corpse because it just exploded or evolved. Um, or if it's a level four, you get to replace it with a phase two necroform or roll a dice and add that many of these. As you can see, sometimes it's less fruitful, but other times you can imagine it's gonna be great. So kind of a risk reward thing going on there. Um, after you've mutated infected models, you get to spawn new models. That means that if you buy a corpse with two of these, then you can get a phase one necro form. Or um, if you buy one of the spawning points with these, then depending on the spawning point, uh, you can get a phase one necro by removing two of these adjacent to a spawn point or a phase two necro form by removing three of these uh, from the spawn point. And I think I misspoke on the corpse. The corpse doesn't give you a necro, it gives you a... Well, maybe it is a necro. Well... Yeah, it gives you a necro, not an exo. So... Uh, I was right on the corpse. I spoke clearly, I believe. I'll, I'll rewatch it and see. <laughs> um, but... Uh, the next step is the infection step, which means if a non-strain model is in a square occupied by one or more of these nano counters, 
they get to make a status roll, which is again, rolling a dice. One, two, three, their status roll failed, and this becomes an infection token on them. Four, five, six, then uh, nothing happens. And there are certain Vanguard units that have uh, abilities that allow them to increase that number to one, so basically a three, four, five, six would be a success for them. So watch for that. Next comes the activation phase. The activation phase starts off by checking your character card to see if you have any of these terrible counters on it that cause effects. If it does, then you resolve the effect. For example, this one causes bleeding, which causes one damage. The character immediately takes one damage. If it kills the character, the character's dead, its activation just ended. Um, anything except a strain unit will be replaced by a corpse counter token. Strain units don't get replaced by corpse counters, they just kind of fizzle out unless they've got the trait allowing them to add the nano counter, which very few do. But those are the really cool ones. Well, you get depending on how you play, I guess. So once you've resolved any of those effects that may be in play on your character, you get to perform two actions. You can A, move the model's mobility value. As you'll recall, the mobility value is referenced by the arrow on the card. Or you may choose to attack a target. You may choose to use a strategic point, or you may choose to use an ability. The abilities, again, are on the back of the card. Um, they usually cost something. Strategic points are these bad boys, which you're going to look at the quick reference sheet. Um, again, check that link. It's awesome. Um, quick note on these. They can only be activated once per, um, per turn. So in one turn, you can activate this once. I don't know if I cover that later on. If I do, please forgive the repeat. <laughs> um, so you can perform any two of those actions. The exception is um, the attack. You can only attack once in a turn. However, you can focus the attack, meaning if all you're going to do is attack, instead of using three dice for your standard attack, you can use four dice for your attack. But that means you're forfeiting the option to utilize any of your abilities or uh, activate a strategic point or move. So you can move twice if you want, or you can use two abilities if you want, as long as you do not use the same ability twice. Uh, and you can do any combination of those things twice, with the exception of the attack, which you can only do once, or focus it and get the extra dice and do nothing else. I think I beat that horse to a bloody pulp. So, um, after you've moved your characters, if you did have any of these wonderful tokens or any of the other effects on you, you will roll a single dice. On the result of one, two, or three, the effect remains on your character. It doesn't do its damage right now because it does its damage at the beginning of its next turn, but it's still there and it's still lurking over you. If you roll a four, five, or six, then the effect is removed and you don't have to worry about it next turn unless something gets you with it again. <laughs> And uh, now kind of to demonstrate how, how the movement works. Um, these white doors that you see scattered throughout the map will open automatically when you step next to it. So if I was here and he was here, he couldn't see me, I couldn't see him. I step here, the door opens, we can see each other. Um, if I step back, then the door closes, he can't see me. So there's a kind of line of sight with the doors. It's a free action, one, two, three, four, five. There was his movement. Um, these red doors, and these blue section doors that divide the maps are a little bit different. If you want to move through one of those, you have to count an extra movement to open and close these. Now, you don't have to close them. If you're the strain character, you probably don't want to. If you're the vanguard, you probably do. Um, but the way that looks is one, two, three, four, five, and I can open the door. And then both of these doors are open, and I end my movement here. Or I could have gone one, two, three, four to close it, five to go here, and then I'd be in a completely enclosed room. So that's the way these doors and these doors work. There are also red lines on the board. I don't know if you can see that on the screen or not, but there's a red line right here. There are also blue lines. The blue lines don't impact movement, but the red lines do. 
Um, the way those work is they, they represent a, a counter or something you can jump over. So in that case, if you wanted to move here, say you there was a bigger obtrusion that covered more area, you would have to go one, two, three, and you continue four, five, or whatever, but you get the point. So it's one, two, three, four, five. So that's an extra movement to get over the red. A large unit is a little different, but not much. A large unit you would think wouldn't be able to squeak through this small area because it's too small for them. On the contrary, they can try to move through areas that are too small just by counting two movements. So if you wanted to move over here, you could go one, two, three, four, five, and that puts him here. Or if you wanted to try to get into here, he could go one, two, three, four, and since he doesn't have six moves, he'd be stuck here. Being stuck can be pretty detrimental to your health because if you are a stuck unit and someone else, say this red guy or this brown guy, uh, wants to take a pot shot at you, uh, if you're stuck, he gets an extra dice. So again, instead of using three dice for his attack, he gets four. And if it's a focused attack, he gets five. So you can see how that can be very dangerous very quickly. Line of sight's pretty easy to track as well. In this game, um, those red spots and those blue spots, I don't know if you can see the lines in the camera, but there's a red spot here and a blue spot here. Those represent cover. If a unit is adjacent to the line, it is considered covered and gets a plus three to its shield modifier. So if I were to attack him, he would get a plus three to his shield. Whereas if I were to attack him, he would not get a plus three, even though it goes through the red line because he's not adjacent to the red line. He's not hiding behind the counter, as it were. Um, he does not have line of sight against him because a unit of the same uh, base size is blocking. Now, if we were to switch this up and say this guy wanted to attack him, he would be able to see right through him because he's a larger unit and that doesn't hinder his line of sight. Um, if this guy wanted to close the gap and take care of that plus three bonus he has, all he has to do is move in next to it. If you're adjacent to a unit, then if, even if that unit's in cover, they lose their plus three defense advantage. A couple other um, triggers here we're going to look at for range is basically you draw a line from the center to the center of the unit. As long as it doesn't go through any walls or clip any corners, you're going to be okay. Um, if a unit is prone or knocked down, again, check out that cheat sheet. Um, then, and if you're attacking them from a distance, they get a plus three to their defense value. If you're attacking them up close while they're prone, you get an extra dice. Because you're right up there in their face and they're kind of helpless. Uh, let's see, what other modifiers do we have? If you are trying to attack something that is adjacent to a friendly, let's say I've got this tank right here friendly to me next to this, then the unit I'm attacking over here will get a plus three modifier. And these can all stack, so you can see how uh, cover can be kind of important in not putting your friendly units next to enemy units. Um, again, going back to the sequence of play, where a unit has to move and attack before the next unit can move and attack. You may not want to move him and attack until he's done his action first. So there's some strategy involved in that as well. Uh, let's see. Uh, of course, we've already covered if they have a target marker on them, they get a, you get a plus three to your attack modifier against them. And stuck defenders get an extra dice against them. Focused attacks get an extra dice against that. So that's all the damage modifiers. That's all the line of sight. Attacking in the game is very simple to keep track of. Um, every figure, no matter who it is, rolls three dice for their base attack. So, in this case, the Vanguard unit decides to use his top Sabrokinesis and rolls his three dice. So, I rolled a five, eight, nine. I rolled a nine. You add the nine to the modifier, which again is right here. So, what does that put us at? Nine, 14, 
and I was attacking this unit, has a shield value of 18, so that attack didn't go through. Let's pretend like I rolled that a little differently, though. Let's say I rolled a 6. Every 6 you roll, you get to roll another dice. If that was a 6, you'd get to roll, guess what, another dice. Or if we rolled that differently and say your first 3 rolls look like that, guess how many you'd get to roll in? That's right, 2. So, 6s can be very powerful because not only do they give you more dice, which gives you more chance to um, get over that that 18 or whatever that target value you need to get is. Um, but on the card, if you remember, there's the damage and the little S, which I can never recall what it means. Um, uh, that does 5 damage just for going through, and then every 6 gives you a 2, so in this case, 4, you're doing 9 damage because it definitely beat the 18 with all the modifiers. 9 damage kills that figure who only has a health of 8. So 6s can be your best friend or your worst nightmare in this game. Alright, thank you so much for watching. I know this has been a long one. Thanks for buckling down. I tried to condense this one as much as I could, but really there's just so much raw material in here. I wanted to make sure that I covered it thoroughly to lay aside any of the confusion that the rules may have caused with some people. I don't even know if that's as big a deal as I'm making, but <laughs> either way, it was very thorough, and hopefully you won't have to reference the rules very often, aside from the little reference sheet you're going to want to download from the link below. Aside from that, thank you so much for watching and subscribing and sharing and all that good stuff. Feel free to leave comments on how you think I can improve these videos. I know they're long, <laughs> but that's kind of the intent. Uh, I want to make them thorough enough that you don't have to look through the rules. Maybe if you're going to have a game night, you can just say, hey, watch this video before you come over. We're going to be good. Or if nobody watched the video, maybe you can watch it when they come over. Instead of having one person read through the rules if you haven't played it in a while and then explain the rules, you can just watch the video and have it all covered. So hopefully enjoy the videos. And until next time, keep on gaming.